We have with us our second speaker for the day. Uh, Monica is a world builder and that's how she described herself to me and I think that is the most intriguing description of anybody's work that I've ever heard. Uh, Monica, she worked uh, on actually building sci-fi worlds with Hollywood studios, uh, tech companies and uh, even governments. So let's hear from her. Uh, we're hoping that this would be more of an open conversation. So we'd love your participations. Please please feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'm, I'm just here to basically guide the conversation. So Monica, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about what it means to build a world. Um, so first of all, I'm sorry, my, my voice is a little um, uh, damaged today, so I can't speak as loud as I normally would. Um, do you guys hear the back? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I design futures for a living, um, and I do that with entertainment industry, tech industry, um, as well as uh, large-scale real estate developments, so be it uh, private, corporate, or governmental, municipal, etc. Um, what does that mean? I, in the entertainment industry, I work as a creative partner to directors um, on sci-fi properties, um, be it movies, series, etc. Usually, you know, very large-scale ones that are not just meant to be a movie or a series. Um, they are meant to, you know, I mean, like imagine Star Wars, Avatar, etc. Um, what you design is a universe in which stories happen and whatever medium that is chosen as a portal into that world. Um, so when you work on these kind of projects, you, the movie or the series might be a flagship product, if we may call it that way, um, but in fact you're thinking already how it also will become a game, merchandise, live experience, VR experience, etc. So you really have to think of not just what we will see you know, in, in the frame on the screen um, when we're in a movie theater, but really how all that universe is interconnected. Um, and so if buildings are built in a certain way, um, then people live them in them in a certain way. That implies a certain type of society. Um, if people eat certain kind of food, then that food needs to be produced somewhere, etc. Now that's not exactly you know, been the, the approach in the past of Hollywood movies. Usually they just like to pick up some flashy technologies um, and yet not think how actually that affects the world um, that people are inhabiting. So you have this, you know, anachronisms like in in uh, Interstellar, for example. You know, with the stories about intergalactic space travel, and yet in the spacecraft they are using pencil and paper. I mean, when I see a scene like that, it literally like jitters me off. You know, or you have this robot that looks very cool and fancy. It's all kind of rectangular, very square but it just makes no sense. If you know anything about technology, you know, such a shape of a robot would just not, I mean, <coughs> make zero sense in reality. So the way I try to work and the type of directors I try to work with is people that actually care about things making sense while also being spectacular, magical, interesting, etc. cetera. Um, and then in order to do that, I'll go and seek out some of the leading minds in whatever future-related discipline. So you know, from nanotechnology, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, robotics, etc., 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 to what's the future of food, to what's the future of whatever, sex or something like that, right? Um, and then I'll, I'll distill these ideas and see how they affect and possibly change the script and how they would inform the world and in some cases how some of these people can become the advisory board um, or, um, or how they could even create something special, right, in, in, in the movie world. Now, that process that I've been doing and actually going and seeking out the real people from the world of science and technology uh, meant that they became aware of the kind of work that I do and some of them, specifically from the R&D departments of, of some you know, very large scale companies, were like, wow, this is a really cool process, wouldn't you mind coming um, and helping us as a tech company imagine what is that future world that our technologies would be inhabiting um, and who would be the people that we'd be interacting with. So that's how I work with tech companies. I mostly um, interact with R&D departments and help them see um, sort of this geopolitical, social, cultural context in which their products, uh, platforms would be set in. 
right? And, and what could be those people they'd be interacting with and, and they'd be wanting to have as their, um, whatever you call, audience or users or participants, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> and, then, and then last but not least, um, same thing, that approach led me to start with through personal connections, and now I think as more people become aware of that work, um, to actually interact with large-scale development, sort of um, architectural, infrastructural, urban development, um, because I think both property developers and uh, some governments are starting to realize that if it's very hard to make people understand the world towards which they're building, you know, and, and towards which they're designing certain policies, especially when they're unpopular policies, right? A lot of, you know, a lot of green policies, in fact, in the areas where they're most needed, become unpopular because they might, for a short period, be economically harmful. Uh, but in fact, it leads us towards a more progressive world. Um, and so, similarly, you know, I'll work with real places, um, cities, countries, regions, etc., um, and help them see towards what kind of world um, they would be building, be it, again, architectural, urban, infrastructural, uh, policy development, and ideally all of these match together. So that's what I do. Interesting. So uh, if you guys have any questions, please do raise your hands. And, uh, um, you mentioned architecture especially, right, and mm -hmm. future gazing in architecture. Mm -hmm. Um, the visualizations that I have seen, right, and starting from the Dubai-esque and the Abu Dhabi-esque sort of mm -hmm. uh, civilizations that they're building versus even if you go to the spectrum of the black mirrors of the world, mm -hmm. to me that design is not exactly utopian. Mm -hmm. It seems very dystopian to me. I mean, all these um, glazy buildings, glasses, um, in fact, I once cringed and said that Humankind has completely forgotten animals in this visualization. I don't even see a single zoo. I don't even see birds flying. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on that? I mean, what is this future gazing? If you are doing this for clients, I wish I could and I could go and tell them that, listen guys, what are you building? But what is your take on this? What are you doing? Um, and is this a problem at all, first of all? Yeah, it's a major, major problem. So I have this double life. My background is creative, but I've grown very much to be a nerd, whilst remaining a creative. You know, I'm not an engineer, I don't code, I don't do any of these things. I, I understand scientific and technological disciplines and then see how they can be translated into creative expression that opens up that conversation to you know, as large scale a population as possible. Um, the reason why I started working with, you know, mainstream entertainment industry, a lot of my friends were very kind of, um, suspicious at first. <laughs> they were like, why would you go and engage? I mean, this is so, you know, they will uh, trivialize the work that you do, etc. I had a sort of very much, um, I had a creative agency in a magazine before, in my early 20s. It was very, very edgy. Um, and, and the reason why I shifted towards working more with mainstream uh, media, as well as large tech companies, is because I felt that that's how you can really make an impact. Because then you, what you're doing is not for a little cool group. I mean, it's important, right? Here we are a little group of sort of innovators and creatives, and I imagine people that are on that edgy side. Um, four days ago, I gave a talk for 500 geo engineers, uh, geo reliance geo engineers, right? At the HQ. So for me, it's important to combine these two things. Now. As per your question, the real issue is that that whole future storytelling has essentially been, and that sounds quite a controversial quote, but it's quite true. Um, it's been colonized by the white man, right? And it's these depictions of the future vision that were initially produced in the West um, by you know, very privileged people, mostly men, mostly straight, etc., etc. So one very particular type. And all of a sudden that became a future vision for the world. And there's a problem in there, 
right? So when I said that I leave this, I leave this double, double life, you know, on one side, I'm, I'm a very much a nerd, and I go on a labs and a fabs of the world and spend time between Silicon Valley and Tokyo and whatever. But on the other side, I've been into yoga since a very, very young age. I always... I mean, nature has been always very, very important to me. I've been always interested in all kinds of ancestral practices, from Chinese medicine to you know, the shamanism of the Amazon region. And as I travel, you know, on one side there's labs and the fabs of the world, and another side, you know, I'm in the Sahara Desert, and um, you know, what is last one? You know, again, in in in, in the vastness of Namibia. Um, Again, spending time with tribes and indigenous people, etc., etc., and understanding. So, for me, what's really interesting is to see how these two things can merge. And uh, I thought that I actually had today on my way here. I've been struggling quite a bit actually with Bombay Air. <laughs> it's been tough. Uh, it's not as tough as Delhi. Delhi is literally impossible. Um, and I was looking at the sky, and the sky was a sort of milky white color. You don't even really see the blue sky. Um, and it's still not as bad as, again, Delhi or Beijing, etc. But we already are struggling to breathe. Right? It causes all kinds of allergies for people who, like me, have asthma. I mean, it's incredibly problematic. Right? But then we see these depictions of future cities and sci fi movies where it's like not even 10 times, like 50 times smoggier. And yet everybody's walking chill without any masks or you know oxygen filtering devices, etc. I mean, now that's just impossible. We, I mean, our physical bodies, we know, won't adapt to that kind of future. Or will change. Will no? I mean, there's no chance. Within such a short evolution, doesn't go, doesn't move that fast, right? So with our physical bodies, as we know, those cities that you see depicted in movies like Blade Runner. Literally, people would not be able to breathe in. And if we destroy the environment to that extent, I mean, if you understand anything at all about um, climate change and more important than anything, climate pattern disruption, right? So people talk about global warming and they have this idea that, oh, we just gradually warm up everywhere. But the bigger issue is, is, the, is the pattern disruption, right? So places that you know, were really dry, all of a sudden get flooded, and places that, you know, had a considerable amount of rainfall, all of a sudden experience extreme droughts, which then resulted in what we've been seeing this year, for example, in California. I mean, literally entire forests, completely, like literally in the middle of the city of Los Angeles being on fire, which in its turn is producing more smog and becomes the air becomes everything, etc. So, you know, if we keep projecting those kind of visions of the future, that future simply would become unlivable, at least in in these kind of bodies and without us continuously wearing some kind of devices that are filtering the air, etc. etc. Right? Um, and so I find that that vision is incredibly toxic. And so one of, one of the things I repeat in almost every talk of mine is media is a modern day mythology. It builds the foundation of our civilization and informs our values and policies for generations to come. And when we keep seeing these visions of cities that are all you know, glass, concrete, steel, where there's no nature, you know, there's no animals, we keep thinking that that is the only scenario. Right, and yesterday, in fact, I had a had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine, who's a chairman of a you know multi hundred million dollar um, construction company. Yeah. Um, and at some point in the conversation, you know, he was telling me how he wanted to 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 transition to what's being completely zero waste. So nothing in, in the factories, nothing goes to waste. Everything is being used. Now. And so he hired these consultants, and then they basically told him, like, well, it hasn't even been done in the West, so it couldn't be done here. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second. I mean, you just 
have to look at what happened with mobile payments in Kenya. <coughs> all the innovation with M-Pesa, et cetera, none of that stuff has been done in the West. And yet it's been done in Nairobi. Um, you have to look at e-citizenship program in Estonia. None of that stuff, I don't even know when it could be done in America. It's being done in this little country of two million, Estonia. My home country, Lithuania, we had you know, mobile app-based parking um, everywhere around all of the cities like since five years or something like that. So your car never gets stored, you always, you know? I mean, you can still pay in these cash machines, whatever. But I mean, these are silly little examples. Um, but it doesn't mean at all that something that could not be done in the West could not be done here, rather the contrary. If it could not be done there, maybe it's precisely why we should be doing it here. Um, you know, and then we had this whole conversation with him um, and I was like, well, for me, what's really interesting emerging trend when it comes to building materials and architecture is kind of, again, decolonizing, decolonializing that space and looking into, it's happening a lot in Africa, um, what are these um, ancestral techniques, what are the traditional ways of, of, of building stuff, and what are the local materials, and how that, instead of just being um, resurrect in its conventional form, how that could be matched with the bleeding edge of science and technology for the future, right? And we know, I mean, already there's some developments even here in India that these houses are way more resistant for the changes of the weather conditions. They will remain, um, you know, cool during the day, warm at night, etc. so much more than, you know, the Western building techniques that are being imported here that are completely contextually irrelevant to here. Right, so these are very much ground level things, but more than anything, we are affected by these imaginations, right? And um, yesterday too, I had a meeting with one of the, my friend told, described me as like the best movie producer here, yeah? in uh, who works on, I mean, very very large scale projects, and I was like, do you have any sci-fi in the pipeline? And he's no, I don't. But I would like to. And I'm like, it's about fucking time. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, I've been really thinking about it. And I'm like, we could, to I mean, we could totally do that. And so, you know, the fact that there, there's been so little sci-fi done here, so, and it's mostly done in the West, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't do it. Again, that's a completely wrong argument. That's precisely why it'd be so fucking cool to make a sci-fi that is set, and or maybe not just set in India, maybe set between Bombay, Johannesburg and Rio, you know? And I think that could be hugely successful. And so we see an example. Um, so I've been fighting for a lot of issues for a long time now. And um, especially in Hollywood, but also, I'm also very involved with immersive media tech, so augmented virtual mixed reality. Um, and for the longest time, I've been saying that cultural appropriation and whitewashing, in fact, is gonna tag the movies. So I was involved with Ghost in the Shell at its very early stages. Um, and I, you know, I felt sort of, <laughs> it was my favorite, actually, I said it's like, I, when I saw the Japanese original anime, um, especially Innocent, because that has incredible world building, I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. Like, so that's what got me interested. And when I found out that Hollywood is doing a version of that, I was like, I have social responsibility to not let them fuck it up. And so I was <laughs> and so I was there from the very beginning, from the moment, actually before even it was greenlit. And I was trying to tell them that let's not do cultural appropriation, let's do cultural integration, let's bring in creatives from Japan, from Asia into the property. Um, let's not do whitewashing. And the way I was trying to motivate that, it's not it's just a moral choice. Actually, it will not make sense financially. The audience will clash back. And the answer to that was, oh, we like you, Monica. We're too forward thinking. In fact, we're targeting more than mass. We're like, we don't understand what is the core base, what is the core fan base, and that they will actually, again, they will push back. Because there was already, you know, Oscar so white, and there was pushback against whitewashing. Um, Exit has happened where, you know, African history was whitewashed, and, you know, uh, a role of Pharaoh in 2015 uh, was cast to be, you know, uh, 
Lily White, Australian actor Joel Edgerton, and people were really, really angry about that. And I could see that coming with Asian, Asian American population. Um, but, you know, the, the, the whoever, whoever the decision makers didn't really want to listen to that. Um, similarly with Blade Runner, you know, I was quite confident that it's not going to be this huge hit that everybody was thinking it would be. Um, and on the other side, what I was trying to motivate is to create the kind of properties that are much more cultural diverse, that are exploring non-dystopian worlds, um, that would be happening in other cultural contexts, not just in New York, LA, or whatever. And people kept telling me, no, 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 but that's, that's not what people are into. However, if you look at the highest success um, of a movie that is not part of a larger property, because um, that's uh, Star Wars Force Awakens, the highest grossing movie of all times, the highest grossing movie that was the first iteration is the Avatar, right? So this positive, utopian, magical vision of a world where, I mean, these are not people, right, but the, the, the population um, depicted are completely in touch with the environment and their view of how technology and nature can coexist um, is very, you know, is both ancestral and very progressive. People love that. People paid money for that. But that's not our world. That was the other world. So the see, so that is the problem, right? So that is the problem is that in all the depictions that we could see, whenever there's any touch of utopian vision, it would never be happening here on planet Earth. We would want to ruin it. Exactly, exactly. Until Black Panther. Right? And Black Panther is basically shedding and tearing apart all these axioms and truths that everybody has been telling. Then, in fact, dystopia sells. I mean, Wakanda is not a perfect world with all its issues, right? It's been closed off, etc. Um, but it's a positive vision of the future. It is completely, you know, completely diverse. And not just made money. It's said to be right now, it's the second highest grossing Marvel Cinematic Universe movie ever. And it's said to actually bypass Avengers to be the highest grossing movie. It is the ninth highest grossing movie in the States right now. And it, you know, it might end up anywhere to be maybe third or, or fourth by the end of its run. So a lot of these things that have not been done, in fact, were not done because people are not into it but because people who were creating that content were not into it. <laughs> so telling that the audiences wouldn't be into it was in fact completely false. And again, there's you know, plenty of examples that, that we could dig out to prove that. It was more that people who were creating it, that was not what they were interested in, precisely because their background did not, in, I mean, it would actually challenge their privilege. Depicting that kind of future world would challenge their privilege. And so they were not venturing out in these spaces, telling that in fact there would be no commercial success. And again, Black Panther is proving that audiences have been waiting for that vision of the world. And just seeing how much positive impact that movie is having, like how many little girls are like, I want to be Shuri, I want to go and study. You know, they're seeing an example of this young woman being chief innovation officer of this utopian country that you know both managed to preserve yeah. their natural environment and progress technologically. And they're like, I want to go and study science and technology. I want to be that. Right? So you know you invite people to follow a positive example. And I mean it's so massive. I mean even right again you could have it's not that it cannot be improved, but what you have when you look at these things, first of all, you have to think how hard it is to push for any progressive idea. Like I don't know how they manage to have these phrases like "Hey, colonizer," or you know, "Oh, another white girl command for me to." Fix. <laughs> 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 or when they started barking on a CIA. I mean, it, it's inc I, I was I was watching. I was like, I can't believe that that was, that was allowed to be on the screen going to, again, to be seen by hundreds of millions of people. 
you know, I was just like, wow. Um, in a similar way, if you look at the way they design the city, well, first of all, you know, there's an urban center, but the nature around it is preserved. I mean, that is massive as a vision, uh, which is towards what we actually should be going, right? Urban centers and rewilding the nature. I mean, that is the only sort of sustainable model. And then whatever habitations would be happening in rural areas, they need to be, you know, not just sustainable, but regenerative, in fact. Um, and so they depicted a version of that in there. Um, secondly, you know, although it was all still very skyscraper, etc., you know, modeled, but the design of their skyscrapers was very much inspired by African traditional architecture. You know, so there were references to the, the you know, the fortresses in Mali, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that was awesome, right? It was a fresh. It was a French version of architecture. I'm also biased, the production designer, somebody I know, and I really admire that. <laughs> so sending out all the love. Um, um, and for me, the most spectacular thing truly in there was that the life on a street level, um, so all of the bazaar, etc., scenes, as well as the high life up in the skyscrapers, were not two opposing things. They were in fact were part of one infrastructure and part of one ecosystem. So the streets were not, they were like messy and chaotic and fun, but they were not seedy or dingy or bad, right? The king himself is literally with just two of his protectors walking down that street and enjoying the liveliness of it. And now we've never, I mean, I might be wrong, but I believe that we've never seen an example like that. And why I think we've never seen an example of that? Because, again, mostly that being done by people who, even if they would have ever experienced that. I mean, all of the people that are creating, I mean, and I know from personal experiences that some of the people that would create a movie, you know, happened in Japan, I mean, barely know Japanese culture at all. And will go on, like, research trip of, like, 10 days and then make a movie about that. I mean, it's just not. <laughs> you know, whereas, you know, the people that work on Black Panther, you know, from Ryan Coogler, the director, who really spent time in Africa, himself also being African-American, um, to Ruth Carter, Hannah B. Ruth Carter, the, the costume designer, they were really spending time on research and seeing how, you know, the, the, these original cultures can be brought and connected and merged together for that futuristic vision. Right? So their design was interesting, was truly informed by the real world. Um, and coming back to the, to the bazaar scenes, um, usually whenever you see that depicted in any of these other sci-fi movies, the street level where the, always is where the poor people live, and it's bad. And for me, it is a commentary on from the West onto the global south. Because there's no, I mean, in, 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 in America or something, there's no more that sort of street, bazaar, et cetera life. I mean, it's, it's dominated by suburban development and malls at the very best. Now you get exceptions, right? There's farmer's market and in, in Hollywood, whatever. But, you know, but it's, again, it's something usually for the rich, right? It's, it's almost like tourist attractions, not this real chaotic, you know, street life that we experience here in Bombay, right? Or Jakarta, or um, Johannesburg, or again, Rio de Janeiro, et cetera, et cetera. And so it would almost, it would always be depicted as something that is bad. Poverty porn. Poverty porn, hashtag, not exactly, hashtag poverty porn. You know, and, um, and for me, that's just another racist bias. And the crazy thing, right, when it's depicted that way, you know, coming in from Hollywood, somehow that gets being imbibed by the very cultures who they're denying and who they're despising and being introduced here. You know, as I say, you know, internalized misogyny is a hell of a drug. Internalized colonialism, colonialism is a hell of a drug as well. Right? As you know, as I interrupted a friend of mine yesterday, I was like, don't you ever say, whenever next time you say that, well, if it couldn't be done in the West, it couldn't be, it can be done here, I'm like, you remember me. <laughs> <laughs>
if it can be, could not be done in ways that precisely why it should be done here, right? So, but I think it's starting to happen, and especially, I mean, it's amazing. You see a lot of that happening in Africa, and it starts, of course, more with creative disciplines. I mean, again, creativity always leads the way, and we forget that. We're so focused on incremental innovation, which happens through engineering, versus actually the paradigm shift that happens through creativity. And then we can work, when we have that bigger vision, we can work backwards from it. So, sorry, such a long answer to a short question, <laughs> but hopefully I'm touching some interesting points. Yes. Um, but the point is that this absolutely needs to change. So we absolutely need future visions of the world that is not based on these completely you know, inhumane steel, concrete, glass, environments that not just, the point is that it doesn't just erase natural environment, you know, the fauna and the flora, etc. It erases our own nature. We are animals too, right? And right now, if you look at the scientific development, we are realizing so much just how much we are animals, right? So a lot of the thought of Ray Kurzweil, transhumanist, etc., is that, you know, the brain is a computer, and if you could just understand all these mathematical calculations happening in the brain, essentially we could be, you know, our mind could be downloaded into a computer, and we could live as an algorithm forever, happily ever after. Now, there's a real cultural bias in there. Um, it's a Judeo-Christian cultural bias that says, body is sinful. The soul is good. So let's erase the body, and, you know, <laughs> which is absurd, and right now, with complexity science, we are realizing how much of who we are, first of all, the brain is not just in here, it's distributed brain, you know, the, the, the brain throughout your body, the, the, all the nervous system, the brain, the gut, etc. to start with, right? The brain is distributed through your body. Secondly, the brain needs the body, because everything else, your microbiome, hormonal balances, disbalances, etc., all that affects actually who you are how you think, what you think, et cetera, et cetera. And the third, we're realizing that the body's not just the body has to be an environment. And so when you look deeper into all the issues right now that we're starting to understand with microbiome, et cetera, is that we absolutely need natural environments. The reason why there's so many allergies, so much cancer, asthma, et cetera, is because we become so, we live in these sterile environments. And so our bodies completely lose the resistance. Um, um, as well as, of course, everything that we eat. You know, right now there's been done research on the, on the glyphosates and how they inhibit um, certain neural processes. And how, in fact, psychologically, people that eat a lot of food that has pesticides will have you know, much higher tendencies towards anger and rage and all that stuff, right? Um, and all these things are never factored in in that world towards which we're creating. So I think we direly need um, these depictions of the future that are contextual for the environment and that we imagine how we could be not just destructive force on this planet. We have to move from that, I mean, it's clear. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't have many decades left. You know, second, we have to move to being sustainable civilization, but we ultimately the goal is to be regenerative intelligence. So how do we think of regenerative cities? You know, everybody talks about smart cities, and you know, I made this equation that you know, smart future plus creative future equals regenerative future. And so we have to start seeing depictions of that. And now if Hollywood is not going to produce that, which, you know, I mean, again, now all of a sudden there's like a hope with Black Panther, um, and that being so successful, um, and let's hope that it's not a one-off, right? That they will actually understand that more products like that need to be greenlit. But all of us need to become storytellers of the future. So tech companies need to start producing imagery of what the future could like that is not this sort of completely denaturized, um, aseptic vision of the world. Like you think there's this... Um, future fiction video that Microsoft had produced a few years back, Microsoft 2020. It was interfaces. Yeah, and it was like, Glass. it was Minority Report, right? 
I'm one minority report. I, I happen to have worked with both John and Kuffler, who's tech concept designer of minority report, and uh, Alex McDowell, the production designer. And I mean, they've done immense work, all the credit goes to them, etc. But ultimately, what did they prototype? The surveillance state society. So all that talent and all this intelligence of how you know gestural interface could kind of work, the purpose towards what purpose? Towards imagining a world that right now Peter Thiel is taking his inspiration from to do Palantir. You know, Muslim registry, predictive crime, etc. I mean full on, you know, comic book villain scenarios. So you know, there was an interesting Twitter, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys on Twitter follow me. I, I tweet a lot of things about that. Um, but there was one interesting thread how, um, you know, we think that a lot of these dystopian um, fiction futures are more about warning us, but actually, like, the right-wing extremists are like, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> so a lot of stuff that seems, you know, oh, we're denouncing that as a bad vision, for a lot of people, it's actually inspirational towards what status quo they should maintain. And then another thing, um, especially if you look at um, Ghost in a Shell, um, I don't have the slides today, but I, I picked the slides from Ghost in a Shell, the, the Hollywood version, not the, not the original, which was very, very different. Um, but the Hollywood version of Ghost in a Shell, the new Blade Runner, and Altered Carbon. And I mean, one of the things that you see, besides, of course, you know, super polluted cities, etc., what you see is insane objectification of women. I mean, it's crazy, and the, it happens. In some cases, you don't even realize that. I mean, in, in in Blade Runner, you have these panning shots of this ballerina, but somehow the shot is from below, and so what you're seeing is her crotch. Right? There's all these pictures, of course, of the holographic wife where, you know, it's like, you know, you're seeing her ass, you're seeing her tits, you're seeing, you know, but in a way that is so, it's not empowered, it's full on objectified. Um, there's a scene right in that city, I don't know how many of you have seen Blade Runner 2049, it's, it's good to see these things just to have critical opinion about them. Um, when you don't want to endorse something, you know, don't pay for it. <laughs> you can still see those things. Um, but, there's a scene, right, where these sort of massive sculptures next to that casino, and the way the faces of these sculptures look, literally like they would be sex dolls, about to give somebody a blowjob. And that's in the future, right? It's 2049. So if we keep, you know, in Altered Carbon, there's a brothel scene where these women keep being strangled, etc. I mean, if you keep feeding that, to people, then as women, we start feeling that is there really no way out? And for men, it just normalizes that. Rather than showing a future world where could where we could in fact be post-gender. Meaning that, not that you can't be a man, I can't be a woman anymore, but that we don't have to be confined to these outdated standards of what being a woman or a man is. Which again, what's incredible with Black Panther, how they broke down that, right? You have the king, the most powerful man of the kingdom, being like, you know, crying and and being super sensitive and being worried and being completely heads over heels with Nakia, right? Who's the spy? Who's super independent? Who's doing her stuff? Who, in fact, is the major influence in him changing the entire policy of his country? Um, you see the warrior women that again are not some kind of like, you know, completely manly. I mean, they're still very feminine, very beautiful, and very elegant, etc. Yet they are, I and mean, she is the most powerful warrior in the country. And the amazing, one of the amazing, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them haven't seen it. <laughs> Can I just like close your ears? <laughs> no, but the, the incredible scene, right, where you know, the two factions get into get into a fight, um, and ultimately, you know, she's being asked, you know, would you would you kill me? And she's like, for Wakanda, yes. And then he's on his knees in front of this powerful warrior lady. I mean, how incredible how they managed to push the standards. And it's not that all of a sudden the men are not manly in there, or the women are not feminine. 
I think they could still have included more gender fluid characters, but you know, you can't ask everything from the first time. <laughs> but you know, when like it's so important, right, that we would see a character that is gender fluid, that does not get themselves defined as a man or a woman, that's not like necessarily a drag queen or, or whatever, you know. Um, and it's the story is not about that. They're just depicted as a human being. So we need more and more examples like that. And with every depiction like in the media, I think the society becomes more inspired to actually just think that such a world could be possible. And you know, on the other side, if we keep perpetuating these stereotypes that exist in the world today and that we know are incredibly damaging and that you know, inhibit us from progressing, then it has very much a real life effect. But fictions we tell, if they're compelling at all, always bleed back into reality. They always do, right? And so you can enter either a vicious circle, where my friend Lori Penny, I mean, says, you know, I forgot exact quote, but it's it's you know we are shaped not just by the stories that we tell, but also the ones that we don't. So if you keep not seeing certain kind of representation, you keep not seeing India in a future context. You keep not seeing people that are differently able. You keep not seeing empowered women. You keep not seeing non-alpha male characters. Then it becomes that much harder yeah. for us to, to enter that space. And coming back to the cities, we know that we urgently need to move towards cities not be just being sustainable, but then being regenerative. We need to move towards the urban design that completely enmeshes natural environment and architecture. We need to look, you know, one of the most important sources of inspiration is biomimicry. Zero examples of that, right? And that work is actually being done today. We need to move towards a world, you know, and just a simple scene in a movie where somebody just goes in a, in a, in a shop in a supermarket and everything is zero packaging. Or the packaging is algae, banana leaf, whatever. And it's just a small scene like that. And then you can add, like, you can make a VR experience of such a thing. And all of a sudden, people are like, oh, wow, well, that's how it could be. Just a small, simple scene of somebody going shopping in a supermarket in that future context, and nothing has conventional plastic packaging, right? It would make so much easier for people to imagine that such a future can exist. Um, and then lastly, even when we have these green visions, because you have some of these things like Venus Project, etc., which are not in entertainment space, they're more like you know, these design fictions of utopian green cities. Um, and they might be utopian in terms of the green aspect of it, but for me they're completely dystopian in terms of um, in terms of the society that it implies, because it completely squashes. I mean, that's where Star Trek is in that similar vein, right? Um, it's utopian in many aspects, but for me it's personally completely dystopian in how it crushes the diversity of our culture as well as generational diversity. And so when we think of all the green action, I think another key thing that we need to think about is how all of the different cultures are being brought and being expressed in these future cities and can really cohabit and coexist. And another thing, youth culture, where is the place for the youth? I mean, even in Wakanda, there was a real lack of kids. What is the, you know, what are the future skate parks? You know, how kids are like tagging, using drones, the buildings. You know, how, you know, what is the youth and street culture and how it actually uses and hacks all the most amazing new technologies for the creative purposes. Um, in the future. Exactly. How technology can be used not just for, you know, killing or economic improvement, but also just for a more poetic existence because that's another big thing, right? We have another question if you'd so, like to... Let me just, let me just finish with that. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, always long answers. Um, but, you know, our beauty poetry is often seen as something sort of completely unnecessary add-on. But in fact, when you take that away from society, where we end up is with the fastest movements. I mean, when you look at you know, neo-Nazis now emerging all of a sudden from everywhere in the States. Um, I mean, what 
what is the common thread between a lot of these people? They do not appreciate creativity, they do not appreciate beauty, they're not really particularly appreciative of environment, etc., etc. But this lack of appreciation of cultural and expressive difference and wanting to squash everybody into some, some one kind of format, I mean, that is the definition of fascism, one of the definitions of fascism. And that's why I feel so vital to imagine cities that are not just green and sustainable, but also creatively and culturally expressive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you spoke about a lot of environment and how it needs to be there in the future. <clears throat> and I agree, it's a very noble pursuit. But what if we're limited by our own imagination in doing so? What if like diseases like you said, cancer or breathing, respiratory diseases, is all a way of evolution, it's natural selection, where we reach a point where all of this doesn't even bother us. And you probably can imagine a city like the one that you said was there in Blaze or no. Is that a possibility that could be considered? Um, so if we predict the future, then yes. But then that's a very dystopian, I mean. But what, when you're using the term dystopian or utopian, that's still, we're limiting it to our own perception of what is dystopian and utopian. Um, I mean, some things are clearly dystopian. I mean, some things are clearly tragedies. And if we if we walking towards that kind of world where the, you know, the sea level will rise, the natural environments will go on fire, which means massive populations getting, you know, losing their homes, losing, I mean, access to water, possibility to any kind of food, etc., etc. So there's no chance a functional civilization could emerge from that. You know what I mean? So there's certain things um, that. I mean, that's just, from, in my personal opinion, there's no future for humanity in that. Because what it breeds, again, a society that becomes completely disconnected from their bodies, completely disconnected from natural environment, becomes a very angry society. And, and a society that doesn't want to communicate, that doesn't, I mean, if we all, again, depictions of the world like Red Clear One is coming out. Um, in uh, I think just a few weeks, and it essentially it shows that future world where everything has got dystopian, and the only utopian or some kind of inspiring cool place is this virtual experience that you escaped. To. But I mean, then we're just resigning to the status quo, which is what a lot of industrial, military, natural resource extraction complex wants us to do. So whenever we resign to status quo, that's, I mean, as everything, as individuals, as well as, you know, corporations, the moment you don't want to innovate, the moment you're not trying to create a better, a more inspiring reality, you know, you're approaching the end of yourself. Which, again, is historically proven. Like, I mean, we just have to look at the Roman civilization and what happened, you know, after Nero. We have this idea that the world progresses linearly, and it's always the upwards curve. But it's not. We collapse if we are not vigilant, and if we're not actually, you know, every day pushing towards positive action. Not just somebody else, but each of us understand the importance of our own action or inaction. I don't think there's just any future for humanity. The nature will survive. It might take, you know, several million years to recover. The nature will, I mean, unless we blow up completely this planet with, you know, some nuclear, insane nuclear catastrophe, the planet will survive. I don't think we would. You know, or a very tiny fraction of humanity would survive and then would need to re-evolve, you know, through whatever amount of time that it would take. Would it evolve for better or worse? I don't know, but... I, I surely know that what that would mean is deaths of not just millions and not just hundreds of millions, but billions of people. And that is not an abstraction. That means entire populations, people with, you know, their loves and dreams and stories and cultures being wiped out of the surface of this planet. 
and for me that is not an abstraction. And it's very easy to, so, you know, simulation theory, for example, is a very popular thing, but who are mostly people that are into simulation theory? They're people in extreme positions of privilege, for whom everything has become this video game. Tell a Syrian refugee that everything is in fact a simulation. I wonder, <laughs> you know, or go and have the experience of a Syrian refugee, you know, like a, a you know, if you're a war photographer, um, a friend of mine, I recommend to see um, his talks if you can, Giles Dooley. Um, he's a photographer, a uh, war photographer, who had three limbs torn off his body in Afghanistan. Um, underwent, of course, a very serious depression, and now goes back and shoots in war zones. and. From what I understood, he does it actually without any assistance or anything. He goes there completely solo by himself. And we were speaking at the same conference, and what really struck me, um, you know, he, again, see his talks, phenomenal. Um, the one, the conference that we spoke at was called How to Change the World. And so each of us, what we're doing is, is we are looking at how to change the world. Um, and so his story was, what he realized that he's going to the places of war, but not to capture the stories of war, but actually to capture the stories of love. Um, and <coughs> tell to somebody like him, you know, who again goes in the most extreme, heartbreaking situations in the world, who himself has been, you know, um, you know, had his body be completely modified. Uh, by that very physical interaction with, with war situation, tell to somebody like him that it's all a simulation. Tell to somebody like him that, well, in fact, maybe that's just the only pathway to the future that we have. Maybe we're all going to get used to it. <laughs> I don't think he'll agree with that. So I, I think we cannot resign to the status quo. The moment we resign to the status quo, that's, that's the end of us. Okay. Yeah. So love, my Lord, really interesting. In the beginning, you mentioned something about the multi-stakeholder impact. How you, oh, okay. A multi-stakeholder impact, how you see governments, uh, mm -hmm. policies, business, and this balance of small spaces and large spaces coming mm -hmm. together to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that happening? So, Black Panther and Aftar are a few examples of utopia we create. Mm -hmm. How do you see it translating to life? How do you see that impact having been created or being created? Mm -hmm. Can you specify a little bit the question for, for individual people or for countries or for, for cities, for worlds, for building worlds, or transforming the mm -hmm. world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, very simply, I think the, the already the depiction of Wakanda is very inspirational <coughs> for a lot of a lot of you know, I mean, African diaspora as well as people in Africa, in in first of all embracing their culture and imagining how they could build the buildings that are not copy-pasted from the Western model um, in thinking how urban, you know, urban development can actually coexist with the natural environment. Um, and, and I think it's, it's... The colonial violence is not just physical, right? It's not just about you know, that amount of people were killed and that type of wealth was taken out of a country, etc. It's more the cultural erasure. And that is violence. Um, I was in Namibia um, earlier this winter, and the Germans have conducted, that was almost like a prototype, the Holocaust in Namibia. I mean, just insane amount of population in terms of the percentage of population. Um, has died through that. But worse than that, so much of their culture was erased. Right? So much, right now, it's like Namibian apple pie. Or like you go to the, you go to the, to the national parks that, that are managed by Namibian government, and everything on the menu is a mixture of American and German junk food. Right? And, the nat and they are original, authentic cuisine is, is completely not present there. 
So all that means violence on everyday basis, right? When people are feeling that they cannot embrace what is their own roots and, and be that their own standards of beauty or their own cuisine or their own architecture, etc., etc., etc. So for me, that seems a really important thing, right? Having these depictions of a world that embraces different cultural contexts, um, a world that is much more inclusive, Again, seeing that vision in Wakanda of the very high tech and life in the towers, etc., coexisting in a harmonious, symbiotic type of relationship with the hectic street life and, and, and the bazaar culture, um, I think these are very inspiring visions. Um, and also the idea that when you are, you know, I mean, in the story, right, they are the most advanced, technologically the most advanced country in the world. And then the end decision is that we have to share that with the world. Right, so that being, you know, I think that we need more stories um, of different kind of success. Of success not of an individual, uh, but success of community. Uh, coming together beyond and despite whatever their differences, you know, gender, racial, cultural, generational, et cetera, et cetera. And we start seeing more of these kind of stories, which again is also very much the story of Black Panther. You know, it's not that Black Panther succeeds, it's more really success is the success of, of them coming together. Um, but also if we start seeing more stories of people in the extreme power positions, who have this realization that in fact real wealth lies not in accumulating the wealth but actually in sharing it. That the future of luxury is not about being exclusive but about being exclusive, about being able to again share it back with larger populations. So if we start seeing more examples like that where success is defined by how much positive impact you can have. You know, where the future unicorns are not about making a billion dollars, but affecting billion lives. Um, that would change. And also if we'd start seeing more success stories of real life heroes. People that, you know, for example, like one of the beautiful, you know, beautiful encounters that I had in South Africa um, just a month ago uh, was a young artist. I think he's age 22. Um, he's becoming very successful, has international exhibitions, etc. Now, he was born into a village, into a remote village, where he needed to go and fetch water for four hours as a kid. And right now, with his success, of course, he's embracing it and, and enjoying it, but he's also thinking, okay, how can I help my village? And how can I help my village? Not like, you know, how, again, a lot of NGOs will have the approach that, oh, we're just going to you know, okay, make a water well, etc. He's like, oh, these practical problems need to be solved, but I also want to give access to creativity to other kids of my village. And so he's thinking not just how to provide sustenance to his people and share his success back to them in that way, but actually how can he provide, you know, also the access to creativity and creative tools. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. Um, I have another incredible friend of mine, uh, Stuart Campbell. He goes under the name Sutu Eats Flies. Um, he's one of the most talented concept artists that I know. In my opinion, he's hands down the best person working with Google uh, Tilt Brush, using that VR tool in, 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 in you know, crafting the world in, in virtual reality. Um, and he's a nomad, kind of like me, you know, travels everywhere. Um, but his base is out of uh, Roeburn in Western Australia, <coughs> um, completely in Aboriginal community, and they've opened a creative center there that teaches the, the kids of uh, the local population creative tools, illustration, animation, VR, etc. And together with the kids, um, they have created a comic called Neomad where the boys are the love punks, the girls are the satellite sisters, and how cool these titles already are. Um, and in that comic, the kids um, are drawing themselves, so each character is actually a kid themselves, like the coolest version of themselves. 
Um, some of them, they use their real names. Some of them adopted certain names. One of the kids is called Born Ready, <laughs> which is amazing. And so they essentially, what happened while they were doing that comic, the line between reality and fiction completely blurred. In a sense that they became that character. They became this... Um, and the stories of the comic, it's a sci-fi comic, you know, they go, they, 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 they travel, um, you know, with rockets and meet these other, you know, alien civilizations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it's, it's very much seeped and connected and rooted in the Aboriginal myths, right, and their culture. Yet it looks into the future. And I had a couple of upsetting conversations with, with some, some, some people, um, you know, even I like actually, I mean, not close friends, but you know, people that I know, and I told him the story, and and the friend of mine was like, "Well, but I'm not sure that that's a good thing." So he's like destroying their like, you know, their true culture, whatever, by bringing these kids, you know, virtual reality headset and stuff like that. I'm like, "What are you talking about?" So an indigenous person should only exist in a museum. When I mean, these kids are using smartphones, anyways, these kids are watching TV, anyways. So instead of wanting to preserve as conserve that culture in a static format, what they've been doing and what he's, he's been helping the kids to do is embrace their roots whilst look into the future. So really kind of remix their reality into something that they dream about. Um, and that became a huge success. You know, they, they, they went to you know, Comic-Con in, in Seoul. They were one of, I don't know if they won the best award for kids comic, but they were definitely among the nominees. The kids were like, all the Kore South Korean little girls were like obsessed with the kids. Um, and what it did, and they produced you know, video material around all that that you can go and see. Um, if you Google Neomad comic, you will find that. Um, and what it did for the kids, I mean, it breathed in confidence in them. Many of them were able to actually um, enter the universities and receive grants. Now my friend's wife, China, so he's the creative one, right? He teaches the kids creativity. She actually works with them on all the social issues, helping them to write for the grants, helping them to not drop out of school, etc. So it's not just all creativity and poetry and sparkling stuff, right? There's, on the back side, they've created also a support system to help the kids through all the schooling process. And once one of the kids entered that university, got the grant, etc., then his little sister or little brother is like, oh, my, you know, my big brother could do that. I can do that as well. And then that created a sort of a, you know, a, an avalanche effect in other communities where you know, people were inspired that they could do that. It changed perceptions of, you know, Australia we know is also still a very racist country. Sadly, it's progressive in many aspects, but you know their treatment of of the indigenous people of the land is is not is not very inspiring. But it started changing some policies. It started you know interesting people and people interesting um, how to say um, you know more people started getting involved with that and 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 changing the perception is always the first step. And that's why I feel creativity is vital and and really participates in doing that. You know, it's not an add-on. For me, in fact, it's the beginning of everything. But just that is not enough. You know, so you inspire your own. You, the, the whole goal is, you know, have to, first of all, you have to open your own imagination. So each of us, we have to become, the, the stories of the future should not be just coming from somewhere. You know, from $200 million Hollywood movies. Each of us needs to start telling stories of the future. First of all, our own future. Then, you know, the future of our community. Then, the future of the world. Of our country and the world. Um, and so in order to do that, we have to start by opening our own imagination. Being curious. Really seeing and understanding what's happening. Because a lot of amazing stuff is happening. A lot of awful things are happening. We need to be aware of that. And that's, you know, where sort of cautionary dystopian tales such as Black Mirror are important because they clearly, they don't fetishize dystopia, they tell where things could go terribly wrong, we need to be aware of that. We will also need to follow a lot of inspiring work that people are doing in all, you know, from creative disciplines to of course sustainability to, you know, everything around um, what's what's beyond uh, technological automation, etc., etc. Um, then, once we open our imaginations, 
we need to find people that we could converse with, right? Because we really grow in conversation, <coughs> not in monologue. As much as you can read about stuff, you expand your knowledge, but you really understand new things when you converse with somebody else, right? And that somebody else has to be challenging you. So they have to be, you know, from either different discipline or different culture, etc. So you need to push yourself outside your comfort zone and enter these conversations that will be the conversations of growth. And growth is always a little painful because oftentimes you have to realize that a lot of things that you've done or said or were thinking were, you know, either wrong or uninformed, ignorant, or in some cases, you know, racist, sexist, ableist, etc. I mean, oftentimes you'll have to undergo experience of shame as well, of what you thought was truth, or what you thought was normal, what you thought was acceptable, that in fact is not. So these conversations are important. Now, conversations are not enough. They have to become active collaborations. So you have to convert into actually doing something together. And what these collaborations should be geared towards is towards behavioral change, transformation. So for me, you know, inspiration is key. Empathy is important, but unless it actually leads towards behavioral change, it's not really making, I mean, it's making a difference, but that difference is not enough. And so, you know, I'm great at inspiration, so I need to work with people who work on the actual behavioral change. So it's all about, you know, I like how, you know, you know now they, they, they're transforming, it's not anymore STEM, it's STEAM, but I like to say it's actually should be about teams. <laughs> so it's not just, oh, these all these different disciplines are important, but actually all these different disciplines together is the only answer that I see towards a world that would not go in flames. Uh, you know, just since I, we're talking about... I need to ask uh, uh, one thing. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go first ahead. of all, uh, I'm like a big fan. Uh -huh. I, I'm following uh, your work since maybe uh, September, October when you gave your first talk at Designer. And uh, Thank even you. myself, I am like, too much into future, future, but only inside India. Because as you said, things need to get cleared from you know, the core level first and then you should see what's happening. So from the whole conversation, and you were answering the first few questions over there, uh, you say you can design a world, and but the world will never be a world without nature, right? Mm -hmm. What I see is that there is another awesome human being living on the planet, which I really, like that's the God for me, Elon Musk. He is really on a mission, and he may have thought of the, all these things, that okay, this is the problem over there, and he decided to, you know, you know, plan a city, plan another earth itself on Mars. Mm. So he's like, okay, he knows that okay, this is going to go away, like, you know, somewhere because not few people, not even a few uh, cities may be coming together and they cannot protect the earth or something like that. It's like a sci-fi movie itself, you know. Mm. They, they, they will just go in a space shuttle and go in Mars and then the new civilization will start and a new world come again. So I think that <coughs> he really has seen the future that okay, this is going to happen somehow. Because there are a lot of people like you, a lot of people who are actually trying to change things, change the perceptions that you need to change. Yeah, so I just wanted to hear that, okay, what, is, what are your thoughts that Casey, the world is coming to an end and there is a new world which is actually getting like born over there. I, I see all his updates, I, I'm like, you know, it's like, uh, I don't open Google, I open his app and I see his website and whatever he is doing. Mm. And maybe someday, like the way he is doing everything in all the parallel businesses over there, not related to any of that, like he is making that flamethrower and rockets together parallelly. I, I the flamethrower was a bad idea. Yeah, I, I know. It, it, was, it was for something else or maybe whatever reason. So he knows the public very rightly. That okay, he knows that okay, what can go viral and what cannot. So I see him building a new world all together. And if we build that world all together parallelly like the Wakanda, like so I see that the director who actually did that movie, uh, and this movie would be a real, you know, you know, you know, inspiration for him actually to build a new world on Mars. Uh, just want to hear your thoughts on this and what can happen like if so I want to see you maybe design the whole world in the Mars <laughs> over there. Because these thoughts are very rare 
I, I, I don't, I see a lot of people talking on design the future and stuff and there are very few actually who men it and who, who actually do that stuff inside. Mm. Okay, now I have to walk, uh, to walk on eggshells, you know, do not insult men in power. <laughs> yeah, there, are um, no, there are no sacred cows here. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, Elon is sort of one of those, right? Um, so, um, first of all, you know, I've, 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 obviously what Elon has done is incredible. You know, and knowing a little bit of his story, so I happen to know his cousin, the eldest brother of Pete and Lyndon, who, who founded Solar City. Also, you know, I got more of an insight into, into um, you know, who he is as a person and all that stuff. Um, he's done, he's done, he's doing some incredibly important work, but it cannot be denied that it's incredibly personified by being white, male vision of the future. It definitely is. You know, that future is not, that future is not inclusive or creative or whatever. It's not the future that I want to inhabit. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm criticizing the work that he does, but I think if, if Elon would be designing the future world, I mean, it would more be like a corporate, you know, maybe dystopia than, than, than utopia. Now, again, fully in admiration of so much of what he's done and from what he's doing, what I mean is that it should not be just him or people like him. You know, the, the, the you know, Mark Zuckerberg's, Jeff Bezos, and people like that were designing the future, which is an impression we're getting right now. So, I think, um, so there's a lot to unpack in there. Um, first of all, <coughs> what I admire about Elon is that, and I would be looking at it a bit differently if he'd only be working on taking people to Mars. The way, and again, I know some people from SpaceX, etc. I mean, <laughs> they work insanely hard. It's like almost unsurvivable, you know, uh, work schedule that they have. And what keeps them motivated is precisely that they, they're building towards that future vision of the world of humanity being interplanetary species. So that is awesome. Uh, what's more awesome for me than that is that with um, Tesla and SolarCity, um, what we're working towards is actually sustainable future for this planet. So the fact that he's on, on one side is tackling issues, you know, of this world, of planet Earth, whilst also thinking how do we expand, that's a great thing. Now, there's a quote that I, of him that I use in some of my talks, and it says, beauty and inspiration are um, highly underrated, something like that. Um, and I love that it comes from his mouth, right? Because he's not specifically known to be a very creative person that invests a lot of money in any projects around inspiration. He's much more an engineer type that we gotta solve this problem, we gotta engineer this rocket and that rocket has to go do this and that and that, right? Um, he recognizes that. Now, in my opinion, people like him either should be working with more people on the creative and social innovation edge or should be supporting more of that. Because again, I firmly believe that technological innovation without humanitarian evolution always equals dystopian future, right? And with his work, and again, he's an engineer that is focused on these very large-scale engineering problems to be solved. They're exclusively focused on technological innovation. Now, we cannot build a new civilization based just on that on Mars. Clearly not. It's like this, you know, tech solutionism that again is so prevalent in Silicon Valley. You know, oh we fucked up this planet, but we're gonna figure a way how to just capture ca carbon from the atmosphere and everything's gonna be alright. It's great if we figure out a way to capture carbon, but we need to also change the paradigm of how we live 
as civilization on this planet. From this linear modality where we take resources, turn them into goods, throw them out as waste, into it being a circular economy, right? Where nothing is wasted and everything is recycled and we understand the value of everything and we learn to appreciate how much in symbi symbiosis we are with everything including just ourselves, how we are not just, you know, the man and the world, you know, it's a very Western paradigm, the man and the world. In fact, the world isn't us. So much of our body is actually external bodies. You know, all the bacteria and, and so much of that is within our own body that defines who we are as people actually is stuff from the outside world. So we are in this continuous feedback loop with the outside world. So, again, admirative as I am, towards the work of Elon Musk. Mine is the flamethrower stuff. <laughs> that was very dystopian. Um, it is crucial that it's not just people like him that decide the future. And it's crucial that when we're talking about, you know, the future on Mars, etc., that we're not just talking about technological solutions. Because if we, and I'm sorry to like, if we fuck up here, we will just import everything that made us to fuck up here to there, right? And that's where I find it dangerous. And again, with Elon, he's working with Tesla and now you know Solar City Incorporated. You know how can we be sustainable here, whilst also thinking of the larger future vision? Great, um, but. But let's say narratives such as interstellar, where you know we completely trash this planet, so we're gonna engineer these incredible rockets, go into another galaxy, and you know colonize a world. That, first of all, colonize a world there. Again, it's a colonial mentality with the values of colonialism. Can anything? truly flourishing be built on that? No. So, for me, there's a real danger in these stories of us, you know, resigning to the failure here so we can do better somewhere else. In a similar way how, the for me, the conversation about artificial intelligence has to include the conversation about cultural intelligence. Because, otherwise, we are bringing in all of our biases into AI. So we're creating this incredibly powerful entity that will have the worst of us. So for me, again, it's, and again, I'm not saying that what Elon does is not good. I'm, I'm a fan as well. I went and watched actually the launch of the first rocket that landed. And I was just in awe as everybody else. So what he's doing is very, very important. But just that is not enough. At that table, there need to be more seats with people, again, from different cultural backgrounds, not just technological innovation, also social innovation, cultural innovation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, for me, innovation is not a gadget. That's the biggest, again, what I see with Silicon Valley, um, and so many of my friends are there, and I admire so many people there. So, you know, the fact that I'm criticizing is not because I'm just dissing it all off, but because I care, and because there are great things here as well. I'm not just saying that everything is bad in the West. The East or the Global South has all the answers. I think the interesting answers truly lie in the conversation between all of us. As we said, right? We have to open our imagination, but no matter how great we are, each in our own thing, truly the new pathways we will find when we converse with each other. And so innovation is not a gadget. Innovation is really about, you can have the shiny, beautiful, incredibly performing thing, but the key is for me to stop thinking of technology as this thing that has a life of its own, as this thing that is completely external to us and really start seeing it as an extension of ourselves as an extension of our biology and something that we are creating and we are using. And in some way, you know, coming back to AI, um, you know, 
so much of um, how did how to really say that? Um, I feel I lost the thread. <laughs> um, yeah, so much of the conversation that's happening, and Elon is part of it as well. Um, you know, AI becoming sentient and that being the, the, the fair and the scare and so many movies done around that, etc. And it's not that it's an impossible scenario. Um, the better and the further we understand human consciousness, the more unlikely it seems. Because again, we're realizing that it's not, the consciousness is not just mathematical calculations. It is distributed intelligence within the body and body exists within the natural environment. Um, and that biology is much more complex than computation. Um, but bottom line, when we focus so much on AI becoming sentient, and we actually give so little attention how very powerful applied artificial intelligence tools could be used by nefarious parties or nefarious individuals, that's why we end up with people like Robert Mercer, Mercer and Cambridge Analytica essentially shifting the results of the election, Brexit, or you know, American <coughs> presidential election, etc. By using very powerful AI tools to specifically target uh, people based on the data they gather around them with misinformation and skewing people's perception of the world and putting <coughs> them in that blur where you know, conspiracy and reality becomes one and the same thing and people aren't able to to sift through information at all. So you see, I mean, that's again a big answer to, to a short question. Um, what he's doing is, is incredible, but just that is not enough. And if we just think that we resign to the situation here and we think that we'll be able to do better on Mars, we clearly won't. that are you know futuristic what is the what's your starting point what is the first thing you think of when you want to build this are you thinking of geography are you thinking of the people who are going to live in it are you thinking of sustainability where does it start when you mm -hmm. want to create something like mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when i give back actually credit to my geography teacher when i was a teenager um i come from a very small country and a small city in that small country. Um, I was born in Soviet Union. When I was a little girl, um, could not really imagine, you know, um, my dream was one day, possibly one day, to go to Japan. And that seemed impossible. And uh, in parallel, the physical walls, you know, the wall that separated us from the rest of the world, has collapsed as the digital world opened up. Now, I'm coming to <laughs> the answer. And the answer is that um, my geography teacher, you know, she, she was obviously much older than us. Um, she was born in really Soviet times. She was enabled to, you know, unless you were a KGB agent, you could not travel. And you could travel a little bit within Soviet Union, but only with, like, it was very regimented, and you definitely couldn't travel outside. Um, but the way she was teaching us geography, the way she was telling us stories of these countries, somehow from a very young age, I started seeing that to understand the place, you have to understand everything about it. You have to think of its geology, of its geography, um, of its culture, of its, you know, um, of its history, um, of, you know, how, uh, how, how, you know, political dynamics around, etc. And so it's about understanding um, all these different aspects, right? And that's how you start drawing in your head a portrait of what that particular country, that particular city, that particular place could be. So I, I think I just had, thanks to her, and, and you know, just recently I was posting something from here in India, and she, you know, she's, my, she's now my friend on Facebook. <laughs> Which is awesome, right? She knew and I was like little bratty, like very difficult kid. Um, but she's very proud seeing you know my pictures from all over the world and she's like, you know, Monica viscerally traveled through you. 
Um, so for me, it all started with that seeing that cultures are, are very complex and you need to look at as many data points as possible and then find a way to merge and understand the relationships between these things in your head and also the contradictions. Similarly, um, how, you know, you can look, you can have somebody like as a person, right, and that's also how you design characters. Uh, you can have all the biographical information about a person and still not know what this person is like, right? So what's interesting is when you know all these aspects and then you hear that person speak, you interact with them, and then you realize how much their biography is you know, either completely predictive of what their personality is or, or actually you know, completely different how much it's not what happened to this person, but actually what they made out of it. And similar thing with countries and cultures, be it real or fictional. So you kind of think, and for me, very important aspect as well, um, and that's a, thank you so much. You keep, keep that as well. um, a very important thing, um, you know, one of the quotes that keeps me thinking, uh, since I read that poem, I don't know, maybe six years ago, T.S. Eliot, and the line it is, and where we are, is where we are not. Which means that so often we are focused on what I am, right? You know, I was born there, I studied there, that's my family history, that's what, you know, that's what I end up doing, etc. And so this is me. But in fact, I think we are so much more the things that we are not means, you know, all the things that you refused, all the dreams that you had but didn't end up pursuing, the things that you projected into the future, the things that you are afraid of, etc., etc. So for me, when I design these future worlds, right, you try to take into account every single aspect of it, of what it is, but so much of also what it is not, what it has chosen to not be. So in case even of Wakanda, right, what it shows to not be, you know, the way it decided to, you know, as Africa in that story was colonialized, you know, it decided to shield itself off, right, and to hide under that cloak, and to not participate in this matters, etc. And so there was a lot of criticism about it, like, oh, but this is also just like, you know, uh, just like Trump's America being isolationist, etc., etc. But if you think of a deeper context, why that fictional country might have made these choices and why, you know, when the king, the Chala, finds out about it, you know, he's crying and he's like, how could we have done that? But he's also trying to understand his ancestors where, you know, if they might have stepped out and become visible before they were strong to participate in the public stage, they might as well have been colonialized and whatever resources that they had could have been used for the worst purposes in this world. So, you know, so for me this is very interesting, right? The first is always a conceptual process. Thinking of what this thing is and also what this thing is not. You know, what this thing refused to be, what this thing didn't want to be, and also what this thing is, you know, where it is going, where it is projected. So for example, when I work, uh, right now I'm working on a pretty, I mean, uh, I cannot say on the record, but um, a big sci-fi project that is very iconic. And initially, you know, because it's top secret, it's you know three uh, three seasons. Um, and initially, you know, the director didn't want another director, the producer, uh, didn't want to give me to see the next seasons because it's top secret. And I was like, there's no way I can work on it. Because I need to understand, already when I'm designing the beginning of it, I, understand, I need to understand where it's going. If I'm just seeing the slate of what happens in the first season, I don't understand what is the ultimate story of it, how it, you know, what is the revelation at the very end, then how can I do it? So you see, for me, it's, it's, it's having that projection. So this is conceptual process. Now, practical process, um, the key, and sometimes it stands at odds. Um, you know, because I'm seen as a creative, as more somebody philosophical, etc. Uh, but from a very young age, I ran a magazine and a creative agency, and so we worked with a ton of clients and a ton of collaborators. And so my rule was, I need to find any HD file to be sent. If I call to the office, within literally 15 seconds, 
that an intern who's been in the office for just a week would manage to find. So I'm like obsessive with how things are classified. So I continuously do research um, and I archive all of that. So in my computer alone, I have, you know, and not in my computer, it's all backed up in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Um, never, tr I mean, and backed up in multiple clouds. Um, you know, I have all the archive research. Whenever I find anything interesting, I, I save it straight away. Um, and on all the platforms, you know, even on Instagram, I find any interesting image. You know, now finally, I was so upset with Instagram that I didn't have this, you know, functionality before. And now you can actually save in different al and you can save it not just in one flow but in different albums. Um, so I do that with everything I find on social media. I do that with everything that I find um, in terms of imagery, videos. I have entire spreadsheets with, you know, the blogs and the Pinterest boards and the tumblers that I like that are specified on some specific subject. Um, and, um, and I have spreadsheets of all people I know across the world, um, you know, in all continents, countries, etc., um, you know, with their discipline, etc. So when I'm working, like, fuck, I need this, you know, I need somebody with real insight into nanotechnology, you know, sometimes your head just goes blank. Well, I, you know, I have a category, you know, whatever, VR or robotics or whatever, and I can find who are all the people, all the good people that I know. Um, don't start from scratch. You already have a lot of source material that you can start building on. So you accumulate stuff that inspires you. Um, and then the third key thing for me um, is you have to build a community. So I kind of go back to where I started with, how you know my curiosity was triggered by the fact that I was you know, born behind the wall and the world seemed inaccessible, and yet I had this incredible geography teacher that made me dream about the far off places, such as India as well. Um, but then the digital world opened up. And so I was on the earliest, I mean not the earliest earliest, but you know, when I was like I think 11, 12, something like that, on the earliest chats, and then I was on MySpace from its you know, very beginning, and so I, I started constructing my digital community. Also because I was from a very small town in the middle of nowhere where I felt like a black sheep and I didn't feel that I had, well, I had a few friends but I didn't have like a real community with whom to communicate. Um, so I built that digital network of people with whom you know, we are connected and related over our passions, interests, tastes, etc. And we might have very different backgrounds, disciplinary or cultural. Um, and I continued building that. So today, whenever I'm struggling, and the key in building that is you have to feed it back. If you're just asking things from people but you're not contributing to community, you will manage to build a community. So you actually, in some way, you have to give more. Right? You have to share your inspirations. You have to, a lot of people are completely paranoid and like, no, but I cannot share the things that I'm interested in because then somebody else is gonna rip it off. I mean, a lot of my work, especially before, um, it's not that I'm super known today, but I'm definitely more known than I was five years ago. At least in this, you know, future whatever related space. Um, so much of my work was ripped off because I generously shared um, what I did. Now, you know, the more and more I move towards, you know, higher visibility, um, some of the things become really associated with me. So it becomes harder for people to rip it off. And whenever some project comes up, you know, people at Twitter are like, oh my god, you should be checking out Monica Bielskita's work, you should be working with Monica Bielskita, etc. Because I become associated with some specific thing. But the point in there is that you have to build also a digital community, a digital network, so that whenever you're struggling with anything, or whenever you're tackling some specific issue that you might not have an expertise or might not be able to build an expertise within a short amount of time that you're working on, you can tap into that place. So whenever I work on something, I'm like, hey, I'm struggling with this thing, and I can't reveal often a lot of details. Guys, would you share with me? You know, what do you think about that? Send your critique my way. You know, give me some names, da 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 da. And it's amazing how people respond. And similarly, translating that into the physical experience of you know the sort of digital nomad life. You know, whenever I am in any city, I will post you know Instagram story, Twitter. Um, LinkedIn, that oh, well, I'm here. Who are the movie shakers, troublemakers I should be meeting? Who are the most interesting, innovative people? And 
some people that I know and friends with, they'll suggest me incredible people, and sometimes it's complete strangers. You know, and some people, you know, some people started off as like my fans when I was again 15. People that I know from the days of like MySpace, etc. And now, you know, somebody like that I met um, in New York a couple of years ago, and he's a venture capitalist in biotechnology and like a super crazy smart person in in that space. And it was somebody that we connected over like photography when you know he was in his early 20s, I was um, in my teens. Um, and it's amazing how you grow that community and how you, how much you can get back if you engage with it. So three, three points, you know, really thinking, conceptually visualizing what this thing is and what it's not and how you can build towards that vision. Second is really archiving and never, you know, it's very hard to start from a blank page. Um, and the third one is have a community that you can tap into forward wise and also for criticism. So you can fill in your blank spots, you know. And these people are real. Your friends that you have around you that will call you out on, you know, where you could have failed, or especially when you're dealing with some sensitive issues, right? Um, you know, whenever you're dealing with some cultures, right? Like for example, if I would do, if I would do a sci-fi set in Africa, by no means. I'm so sorry. Um, my alarm clock. Um, um, by no means I would pretend that. <laughs> You know, I'd be able to design a sci-fi world set in Africa myself. You know, I can be, you know, I can be the world designer on that, but in very, very close partnership with a ton of creatives from there. And most likely not even as a singular world designer. I would have to pair up myself with somebody and really work as a duo. Because you want to be called out for something, you know, for something that, again, your lack of knowledge, your ignorance might, um, you know, create an issue. You don't want that? Perfect. We have one last question and then I think, uh, I mean, I could do this all day. Pretty much all day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we have one last question, so we'll take that and... Uh, and everything I say, you know, this is, I mean, this is my process. These are my personal opinions. By no means, you know, this is some universal truth. It, it's all subjective. So that's what works for me. This is what I think and this is what I'm vocal about. And, you know, tomorrow in conversation with somebody else, I might realize that I was completely wrong about something. Though I'm quite firm <laughs> <laughs> about the, you know, for example, you know, just Elon Musk and people like him designing our, you know, the future of humanity. But, you know, never know. I might, I might have a revelation. <laughs> yeah, we might see you with the Don Musk sitting and discussing about the same thing, like telling him that you should design the world like this. <laughs> I'd love to work with him, you know, like, uh, you know, and again, I've visited SpaceX, it's, it's so impressive, when you are within SpaceX and you see all these rockets being made, I mean, it's spectacular, but the future is not just that. It's not that it's not that, it's not just that, it's yes and. <laughs> My co-founder always teaches Monica, it's not no but, it's yes and. As long as not Nazis. <laughs> there's no conversation, there's no, you know, there's no fruitful conversation to be had there with people that undermine your very humanity. So it's not like, you know, for me it's like this freedom of, freedom of speech and freedom of collaboration, but, you know, with people that actually are there to collaborate rather than just exterminate. Do we have time? Yeah. yeah. I just want to know, you work with governments. Um, how receptive have they been to these solutions or to actually investing time and money in um, building sustainable worlds? And which countries, according to you particularly, have actually taken the time and money out of the water? Um, so this is the most recent edition. It's really it's just from last year that I started to work on that kind of stuff. I've been involved with UAE. Um, I try to push for a very progressive vision, the vision of, you know, creativity, green technologies, and, and embracing more of cultural diversity. Um, how receptive they were to that work at the end, I don't know. The fact that somebody <coughs> like me was, you know, somebody pretty politically outspoken, etc., was allowed to be there alone, you know, sometimes the change that you bring on is not immediate. 
right? When I give a talk at a company like Reliance, it's not that they will change their point of view the day after tomorrow. Sometimes you're seeding these things, you're seeding, you're seeding positive inspiration, and in some cases you're seeding some doubts over the status quo. And little by little, I mean it's like inception, right? And, and little by little it grows. So I don't know how receptive, for example, UAE government was, and who ended up finally seeing that work, and how well it was translated. Because as a consultant, you know, you never, <coughs> You know, you never, you try to do your best and then people make out of it what they make out of it. Um, you know, countries obviously like like Canada, you know, are very receptive right now under Trudeau's government. Uh, they're trying to really differently, for example, than America. Um, they've been both almost equally bad, maybe not equally equally, but almost equally bad to the, to the indigenous people, to the First Nations. Um, but Canada now is under Trudeau is trying to make massive strides um, to re-embrace the First Nations and recognize that they were there first and, and allow their culture to be visible, etc. Um, countries like New Zealand as well, similar thing with the Maori community. Um, in New Zealand there's also so much because also they realize that natural resources meaning nature rather than extracting natural resources um, is, is a key driver for the economy. I mean, tourism is, is, is a way more, you know, sort of, um, how do you say, um, just economically interesting industry than, than, than destroying that world and whilst also polluting your civilization and, and, and uh, creating health hazards for your own citizens, etc., etc. Um, so they've been doing some very, um, very progressive work. Just actually recently, a friend of mine introduced me to um, to somebody in a very interesting position uh, there in New Zealand, and I was like, "Yeah, let's 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 do something together." They, um, I believe that it's in New Zealand that they classified a river or national park. They gave it uh, the same rights as a as a humans, right? Whereas, like in America, you know, corporations have the status of a human. But not at all. Like you know, Trump is, is decimating the, the. I mean, every all the controversies going around Bears Ears National Park, which are the sacred grounds of the indigenous people, and it's some of the most incredible, gorgeous landscapes. And they basically are opening it up for the you know oil and gas extraction. Um, so unfortunately, it's more like uh, smaller countries. Um, earlier. This year, I was invited by the, the, the Ministry of Culture of Estonia. Um, so I myself am Lithuanian, but Lithuanians have not yet bothered to, to really fully involve me in their stuff. Um, I mean, they reached out, but they didn't make it interesting enough for me. They're like, oh, but you're Lithuanian, so you should do it anyway. So I'm like, no. <laughs> um, you know, and it was interesting, right, because I was invited with you know my message of real cultural diversity, gender parity, etc., and how that is actually economically interesting and and, and culturally beneficial, um, and I ended up you know with a conference where 16 people were on the stage that day, and I was the only woman. And then I called that out, um, and of course it made some people uncomfortable, and some people were like, oh, but you know you were invited and you were paid, and then and then you actually like criticizing it, and I'm like, well, I have to do that, and I know that long term they will appreciate it and sometimes in short term they appreciate it because a lot of things um, a lot of mistakes that we do I mean that there, there is always a part of our population um, and some of that population are in the positions of power that are intentionally malignant right they are intentionally cruel evil people but that is a tiny percentage of population in fact, in most cases, when people act, you know, sexist, racist, ableist, xenophobic, discriminatory, it's mostly their lack of understanding. It's mostly their lack of knowledge. You know, there was a pretty revealing uh, video I just watched the other day. Um, Korean reactions, Korean people's reactions to Black Panther, because part of it was shot in Korea, and there were actually a lot of answers where they were like, 
you know, actually, you know, we didn't really like the black people because we thought that they were like, you know, either thugs or hip hop art, but, you know, and all of a sudden now we realize, oh, black people are cool. And their culture is interesting. And, you know, people were very, I mean, they were very honest, right? Because I guess there, the conversation around racism is not so, you know, it's not yet in, in fully public perspective. And so these people on the street, they were literally saying that. They're like, you know, actually, we, you know, we didn't really think that black people had much to offer to, and now we saw this and we're realizing that, oh, like, I want to have black friends. I actually want to maybe go to Africa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they were just saying that yes, I had racist views, but it's because simply I didn't know. And I think it's the case, you know, there's a chosen ignorance as an ignorance that simply because your culture, <coughs> environment, the society in which you 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 grown up in, your family did not expose you to something. I had a very poignant story um, another, with another friend in South Africa who was born to a white farmer, Afrikaans family. Um, in South Africa. And he told me that the first black person he actually honestly interacted with, like actually had a proper conversation with, um, without some kind of adverse situation was when he went to study in UK. And his head of the lab, you know, the PhD, uh, the professor, you know, who had a PhD, etc., was a Nigerian scientist. And for the first time in his life, he realized, oh my God, black people are, you know, I can admire them. And it seems so shocking, right? I mean, I didn't have I didn't have, you know, I didn't have uh, black people around me growing up, you know, in, in Lithuania. I didn't have those kind of ideas. But it happened so that in his family he was so indoctrinated by racist Afrikaans ideology that he couldn't help but see the world that way. And it took him to leave actual continent of Africa, go to UK, study under the professor that was Nigerian to realize what he could have known all along. And now he's doing incredible work with, you know, with diverse communities and, 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 you know, and he's struggling to be around his family. Because now the moment they say some of these things, it's become so unacceptable for him. So, you know, I think that's, an, again, another lesson that so much of what we do and, you know, so much of a conversation around also, you know, gender dynamics, male, female, and sexism and all that stuff. And we tend to all get angry at each other because so many tensions have been brewing up. But, I mean, we all make our own choices, but sometimes it's really us not being informed enough. And so I'm, I'm just thinking, how can we help each other to grow? How can we stop perpetuating these stereotypes that men have to be that way, and if you're not that, then you a pussy or something like that, right? Um, and that women have to be that way. and like. And, and how we can help each other to understand what hurts us and what empowers us and, and go towards the future where we understand that we're all in this together and the better all of us are, the better we are off all of us. So, again, another long answer. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here. And I guess uh, one of the key takeaways for me was that the we're not perfect right now, and the future is not going to be perfect, but that's that's okay. Yeah, I think that's the key. For me, it's not about, you know, it's not about perfection ever. It's not about utopia. It's about us striving forward, because utopia is a very, you know, when, when I criticize dystopia, people are like, oh, so you want to just imagine utopia. I mean, I don't think such thing as utopia exists. There will always be issues and struggles, and when we overcome something, then we'll be dealing with something else. The point is, we know that we can solve a lot of things. And, and the future towards which I want to build is a future that is post-gender, post-race, post-nation state. And it doesn't mean, again, that gender or race or nation state should not exist, that we should not be limited to what these outdated notions allow us.
And also, when it comes to post nation state, I mean, that raises a lot of things whenever I say that. Um, you know, I don't mean that countries should not exist any, anymore, but we actually, you know, we can belong if we choose so. We can belong to a country if we choose to. We can be a global citizen. But first and foremost, we have to start seeing ourselves as the travelers on Spaceship Earth. And only if we do that, we'll be able to tackle the massive issues. And the biggest one of them all right now is climate change and climate pattern disruption. And everything that comes with it, right? Because it comes with you know, the thawing thunder that is releasing the viruses and bacteria that have been frozen in for millennia. How are we going to deal with that? How, so, so many problems that are happening and that are appearing today that we will only be able to tackle as a global civilization, which doesn't mean that we have to have one government. I think on an individual level, we have to stop antagonizing and seeing each other as, you know, I am from this country and you historically were my enemy, so I'm going to still hate you now. Whilst some reconstitution and some retribution is, I mean, not retribution, sorry, um, certain justice still needs to be made. So a certain sort of post-colonial history and what's happening right now, I mean, a lot, I mean, a lot of these things are still happening in India, but so much of that is happening in Africa because it's been exploited by foreign powers for so long. And so some of that justice needs to be done. But it cannot be done just in rage and anger. But some countries, specifically in the Western world, specifically in Europe, have been responsible for really insane injustice that's been executed there. And the way the image of that continent has been painted as the continent that continues to need help, in fact, it needs less of foreign powers messing with it. Because, you know, for example, Congo, that is the poorest country on Earth, in fact, is one of the wealthiest countries on Earth in terms of its natural resources, except that the conflicts have been artificially brewed and pitted because we thought that we could isolate these conflicts. But we can't. A conflict somewhere and a certain issue, you know, a, a, a terrorist blowing up um, a nuclear power plant is a problem not just for that country. It's a problem for the rest of the world. And we have to move towards that. And whatever that we do, I think, you know, no matter if our work is tech or advertising or media, whatever, we have to think of what is that bigger picture towards which we are working. Recently, I had a director, um, uh, an African director actually, uh, proposed me to work on a project. Um, and I've been wanting to work there on a the continent. But his project was another dystopia on the class divide. And although there were really cool things in the story, I was like, I just don't want to work on another thing that is based on this classic class divide and continuous vision of the future that's just the rich and the poor, and there's no revealing there. I mean, you can imagine that, but then you realize, in fact, not everything is what it seemed to be. Um, and so for me, it was important. Although it was an opportunity that I wanted to take on, I was thinking, OK, that particular project towards what kind of world I'll be creating it and what type of impact that it would have. Because whatever content that we create, it will empower and involve in certain ideologies. Whatever technological platforms that we design will allow for a certain kind of behavior. And so nothing is really neutral, right? We are embedding certain things within the way we design that. Be it technology, or ads, or media, or whatever else, right? So I think we have to start being more conscious of that. Thank you so much.